Okay, so we are here. Hello all, all those who are attending. Thank you so much. We appreciate your attendance. Um, uh, hello and welcome. The School of Theater Arts is pleased to present this public lecture featuring Dr. Khalid Yaya Long. Uh, Dr. Kali Yaya Yong is a professor, assistant professor of theater at Columbia College Chicago. Before we begin, I'd like to point out a few ways that you can contribute your thoughts and questions to the conversation. Below, you will see your chat box. It is activated and ready for you to post comments as we have already begun to do. Uh, if you have any comments for Dr. Long, I encourage you to definitely post them. Uh, it's a terrific container in which to engage in discussion with each other as well as with, the, with the, our host. If you would like to ask a question, you're more than welcome to post it in the Q&A box as well. At the end of Dr. Long's lecture, there will be about 20 to 25 minutes for a Q&A with audience. I encourage you to raise your hand and to offer your questions or comments to Dr. Long uh, and the audience. You will see a host would like you to unmute microphone, bo uh, microphone box. From there, you can unmute and ask your question or offer your, com your comment. Tonight's event is being recorded and will be live streamed to our BA Theater Arts YouTube page uh, or will be posted later after the event. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Khalid Yaya Long. Dr. Yulong is Assistant Professor of Theater and Coordinator of the Theater Studies Program at Columbia College Chicago. Dr. Long has published scholarly essays in Continuum, the Journal of African Diaspora Drama, Theater and Performance, the Journal for American Drama and Theater, the Rutledge Companion to African American Theater and Performance. Dr. Long has also contributed essays to Black Masks, a long established Black theater and performance periodical. Dr. Long's forthcoming scholarship includes articles in Theater Design and Technology, TDR, The Drama Review, Critical Essays on the Politics of Oscar, Hammerst Oscar Hammerstein II, and Drifting Through the Wonderlands, The City of a City as Performance, among others. Dr. Long is currently co-editing a forthcoming anthology, Contemporary Black Theater, uh, Acts of Rebellion, Activism, and Solidarity. Um, for Methune Dramas, Agitations, Political agi Agitations, Text, pol Politics, Performance Series with Deron Williams and Martine, Gree, uh, uh, Key, Martine Key Green Rogers, who will also be a special guest for us in the spring. Uh, spring, y'all, so look out for that event. Dr. Long is excited to share that he will also serve as co editor of August Wilson in Context with Cambridge University Press. Dr. Long is a freelance dramaturg focusing on production dramaturgy, new play development and audience engagement. His recent dramaturgical credits include Relentless by Beatles, oh, by Talia Albuquerque, directed by uh, uh, Ron O.J. Parsons at Timeline Theater Company. Mom, How Did You Meet the Beatles by Adrian and Adam Kennedy, directed by Baron Kelly at Forward Theater. Ooh and Kill Move Paradise by James, uh, by James Eames, directed by Daniel Drake, Danielle Drake at Rep Stage Theater. Dr. Long earned his PhD in theater and performance studies at the University of Maryland College Park and is currently working on his manuscript of which tonight's lecture is titled, An Architect of Black Feminist Theater, Glenda Dickerson, Transnational Feminism and the Kitchen Prayer Series. Please welcome, please welcome the wonderful, the fabulous, the amazing scholar that he is, Dr. Khalid Yaya Long. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, you know, I know it is 6.04 and I know that I need to wrap up around seven um, and I wanna take up all of your time. So I'm gonna jump right in. So but first and foremost, allow me to thank you all for having me, um, especially the theater department at Illy, Illinois Wesleyan University. Um, and of course, especially, um, you know, I'd like to thank Dr. Michelle Gibbs for the gracious invitation to join you all today um, to present my work. Um, I am going to go ahead and get started. What I'm gonna do now is 
I want to share my screen just to see if I can bring this up. Um, and I know you all can see this. And I want to try to see if I can play this from the start. Uh, the, no, I can't do it. The problem is when I play this, I um, it doesn't allow me to then see my writing. Um, so that's OK. That's all right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I think I need to make myself of you is that good okay i think that's great um i know some of you when you joined on you heard me talking about uh with dr give the with dr gibbs the um uh hurricane ida i was caught in new orleans uh for a few days um and it was just a terrible experience but, but i saw in the chat that melanie you said that your area was hit pretty hard so i just want to send my thoughts um and prayers with you and of course to those affected by hurricane ida in the south as well as up in the northeast area and so forth. Um, so just keeping you all in thoughts. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, as the title of this is um, an, an Architect of Black Feminist Theater, Glenda Dickerson, Transnational Feminism, and the Kitchen Prayer Series. So I first heard the name Glenda Dickerson while in graduate school at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. I was granted the opportunity to complete a creative thesis, a dual project comprised of a full and scholarly thesis accompanied with directing a main stage production. After much consideration and deliberation, I selected Pearl Clegg's A Song for Coretta as the play I would direct and write about for my thesis. In fact, it was during the researching and writing of my master's thesis that I learned there was a such thing known as black feminist and womanist theater. I had heard of feminism and was slightly familiar with womanism, but I was completely unaware that Black women theater artists, particularly those who emerged during the Black Renaissance of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, were radically influential in the burgeoning of the contemporary Black feminist movement altogether. Artists such as Alice Childress, Lorraine Hansberry, Adrian Kennedy, Ntozaki Shange, and Alexis DeVoe, among others, wrote plays that asked spectators to reconsider static notions of blackness, gender, sexuality, and other cultural markers of identity. And while many of these artists did not employ the term feminism as a phrase to identify their plays, their works nonetheless forced both audiences and critics to reconsider their interconnecting forces of black women's identities. My thesis advisor, Professor Paul Bryant Jackson, instructed that I read an essay by theater scholar Frida Scott Giles entitled, in their own words, Pearl Clegg and Glenda Dickerson Define Womanist Drama. This essay was most enlightening. Indeed, Giles's important essay helped to further my understanding of black feminism and womanism as theoretical paradigms activated in theater and performance. Additionally, I was introduced to Glenda Dickerson through this essay. I immediately became enamored with her. I was in awe of her accomplishments and I wanted to know more. A host of questions arose. What else has she done? Is she still creating works? Why haven't I heard of her? The latter question led me to ponder, why isn't she included in the foremost scholarly discourses, especially in the classrooms pertaining to American theater, black theater, women in theater and feminist theater? A few months prior to entering the doctoral program in theater and performance studies at the University of Maryland College Park, Glenda Dickerson made her transition to sit among the ancestors. Although it was later learned that Dickerson was indeed suffering from a terminal prognosis, her death was nevertheless a shock to the intertwining worlds of academia and theater. In the wake of Dickerson's death, I found myself still wanting answers to my questions. Yet at this time, I had a new question. Who would remember her? Glenda Dickerson is recognized as a pioneering Black woman theater director. A highly sought after stage director, Dickerson was one of the few African American women to direct on Broadway with the 1980 production Reggae, a musical revelation. She also directed for prominent theaters throughout the country, including the Negro Ensemble Company, the Seattle Repertory Theater, and the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. In doing so, Dickerson worked with many well-known performers, including Lynn Whitfield, Linda Gravatt, Robert Townsend, Angela Bassett, and Debbie Allen. 
However, a more expansive view of her career would highlight Dickerson's vital role as a playwright, an adapter and divisor, a pedagogue, and an architect of Black feminist theater. My current project and process tentatively titled An Architect of Black Feminist Theater, Glenda Dickerson, Transnational Feminism, at the Kitchen Prayer Series, aims to recover Dickerson from the hidden cracks of theater history. In recuperating Dickerson and reviving her works, I'm reminded of a question posed by editors Jana Brown and Tavia Nyong'o in the introduction to the special edition of Women in Performance, a journal of feminist theater entitled Recall and Response, Black Women Performers and the Mapping of Memory. Brown and Nyong'o asked, quote, can we remember people and performances without trying to reconstruct whole stable figures? I am not concerned with reconstructing Dickerson as a whole stable figure. In fact, in approaching Dickerson and her work as the product, effort, creations of a multifaceted theater artist, I am, however, an invested, invested in illuminating how Dickerson, how Dickerson, who was an active agent that intervened in dominant discourses surrounding feminist theater performances, read white women scholars and practitioners, also intervened in the foremost masculinist ways of creating and staging works about women of color, thus concretizing a black feminist womanist theater and subsequently modeling a black feminist theater theory through her praxis. An architect of black feminist theater is twofold. First, this book is about excavating Glenda Dickerson as a pioneer of contemporary black feminist theater and reviving her works so that they may be included within the canon of contemporary Black feminist performance. Scholar Ashawn Crawley inspires my use of the term architect. Crawley writes, quote, architects do not create. They gather and create based on what's already there, even if what's there is emptiness, because that emptiness, that nothingness, is full with the capacity to be imagined otherwise. They take what is in the world, its land and air and sea, and let the mind dance and play in order to think through space and place differently. Architects are not originators or even builders, but they are innovators, end quote. As it currently stands, my project is divided into two parts. In total, the book assesses Dickerson's artistic career, critical scholarship, and Black feminist interventions and performs a close reading of her unpublished contemporary dramatic work, The Kitchen Prayer Series. Accordingly, this project will consider the history and development of African-American theater and performance through the lens of Dickerson's work in theater. Dickerson's theatrical career from the 1960s up until her death in 2012, it's comprised of shifts, aesthetic cultivations, and liberatory practices that allowed her to pull away from conventional theater, as well as subvert dominant forms and methods for creating theater and performance. Thus, I recognize how documenting her story can open up the gates to bring forth other forgotten, lost, or silenced Black women in theater and performance. Part one situates Glenda Dickerson within the cultural and historical gene genealogy of African-American theater, as well as Black feminist performance. Specifically, this section charts the evolution of Dickerson's theatrical career, thus highlighting crucial moments that shape her creative approaches to theater and performance. A prodigy of the Black arts movement, who was educated and inspired by illustrious theater faculty at Howard University during the 1960s, Dickerson became a spearhead of the Black theater movement in Washington, D.C. towards the late 1960s and well into the mid-1970s thus helping to establish and maintain some of its most prominent institutions, including the DC Black Repertory Company, Workshop for Careers in the Arts, which later emerged into Western High School for the Performing Arts in 1974, and was then renamed Duke Ellington School of the Arts in 1976, and the Black American Theater, founded by Paul Allen, in which Dickerson served as artistic director from 1969 to 1972. Dickerson's career in commercial theater was quite successful, receiving an Emmy Award in 1971 for her direction of the televised performance of Alice Childress's play, Wine in the Wilderness, 
a Peabody Award in 1972 for conceiving and directing For My People, and an Odelco Award for Best Director in 1977 for her devised production of Magic and Lions. Dickerson became one of the preeminent artists of her time. In addition to her own written, adapted, and devised works, Dickerson maintained her reputation as a director throughout her extensive career. After a controversial stint on Broadway with reggae, for instance, Dickerson began a streak of mainly directing plays by Black women playwrights where Black women were central characters. These directorial projects include No by Alexis DeVoe, that was 1981 at the New Federal Theater, The Haitian Medea, an original adaptation at the Hansberry Sands Theater in Milwaukee, Ma Lu's Daughter by Gertrude Greenwich, 1983, No Smoking Playhouse in New York City, Black Girl by J.E. Franklin, 1986, Second Stage, New York City, Tale of Madame Zora by Aisha Rahman at the Ensemble Studio Theater, 1986. Long Time Since Yesterday by P.J. Gibson, 1988 at the St. Louis Black Repertory. Wet Carpets by Marion Washington, Crossroads Theater, New Jersey. And Shaking the Mess Out of Misery by Shea Youngblood, 1988, Horizons Theater Company in Atlanta. Not only do these productions symbolize Dickerson's turn towards a Black feminist consciousness through artistic praxis, but it simultaneously evidences the burgeoning of Black women playwrights receiving a steady stream of production at well-established theater companies. While Dickerson's theater has been described as closely akin to Ntozaki Shange's lauded choreo poem, her experimental works preceded Shange's commercial success. According to Tukwana Boston in Bear Cats, Dickerson was doing this stylistically devised work before Shange, quote, drawing on her intense choral training and oral interpretation, which she learned from Owen Dotson at Howard University, and combining this with her highly developed sense of movement, Dickerson was perfecting the choreo poem before the term was coined for the famed production for Colored Girls by Ntozaki Shange. Dickerson's dramatic works, from her miracle plays to her street theater to her performance dialogues, used material from the real world to create a mythopoetic realm, a theater that embodies history, culture, symbols, dreams, and inspiration. Dickerson's plays combine Greek mythology, African tales, and African-American folklore further articulated through oral narratives, choreographed movements, spirituals, ensemble compositions, and cultural artifacts. However, unlike her contemporary Sean Gay, Dickerson never saw her work as a playwright and conceiver into mainstream commercial theater. Though Dickerson was well respected within the commercial theater arena, particularly as she was a noteworthy figure during the development of black theater from the 1960s throughout the 1980s, she opted to create theater for more academically inclined institutions and community spaces. Dickerson would later proclaim that academic theater allowed her both a space and a sense of freedom to conceive and direct works that she felt were most impactful without the constraints of conventional theater. Quote, my vision could not be contained in a bedroom, a kitchen. Dickerson's Black feminist consciousness carried over into almost every aspect of her life. It is especially evident in her pedagogy as professor of theater. Dickerson taught at the following institutions, Fordham University at Lincoln Center, Mason Grove School of the Arts, SUNY at Stony Brook, Rutgers University, New Brunswick, Spelman College, and the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. When Dickerson joined the faculty and subsequently took on the role as chairwoman of the Department at Drama, of Drama at Spelman College, a historically Black college for women located in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, she made it her mission to bring to the institution works by and about women, especially Black women. Dickerson's former colleague, Paul Bryant Jackson, expounds upon Dickerson's efforts at Spelman College, quote, she sought to fuse the Department of Drama and Dance, and to this end, she facilitated guest artists, residencies, and performances with noted African-American women choreographers, Blondell Cummings, Diane McIntyre, and Debbie Allen. 
Professor Dickerson emphasized that the women of Spelman should be at the center of their own discourse and encouraged student writing and performance pieces that explored the lives and struggles of Black women. She also encouraged the production of works by Adrian Kennedy, Lisa Jones, Kia Corthorne, Antizaki Shange, Josephina Lopez, and others, end quote. After leaving Spelman, Dickerson went on to the University of Michigan Ann Arbor as professor of theater and drama in the School of Music, Theater, and Dance. Additionally, Dickerson served as head of the African American Minor in Theater Studies, and from 1997 to 1999, she served as the Associate Dean of the Rackham School of Graduate Studies. Continuing to develop works of distinction, such as the Kitchen Prayer Series, Dickerson nurtured a host of students while at the University of Michigan, such as prominent playwright Dominique Mauricio and scholar, scholar of Black feminist studies, Ruth Nicole Brown. As a Black feminist theater artist, Dickerson's dramatic works challenged the realist model for drama and centered Black women's voices and experiences. Accordingly, Dickerson's creative works were concerned with recovering the lost or silenced voice of Black women. Moreover, Dickerson was not only concerned with shifting the subject of theater by bringing Black women in from the margin to the center, but she was equally concerned with discovering new methods in which to forge new aesthetic and pedagogical ground. As Frida Scott Giles notes, quote, though her university and professional work often called her to direct realistic plays, Dickerson shaped under the restraint of realism. As she experimented with forms to reflect her ideas, she steadily built a body of work that tended toward the stylized and expressionistic. Dickerson was committed to her task to quote literary feminist scholar Patricia Maya Spax, the task not only of enforcing new ways of seeing, but also of discovering new ways of saying. Although Spax was not addressing Dickerson or her work, I find her, her words quite apropos to frame Dickerson's career in theater. Accordingly, Dickerson spent much of her lengthy career endeavoring to develop an aesthetic for a type of theater that was not only Black, but most importantly, woman-centered. Part two of my larger project investigates how Dickerson's theater animates some of the principles of contemporary Black feminist performance theory with her final artistic work. So it is here where I will now turn to to, to discuss Dickerson's Kitchen Prayer series. So before her untimely death, Dickerson initiated a lengthy venture, the project for transforming through performing, replacing black womanly images at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. The overarching aim of the project for transforming through performing was according to Dickerson, quote, to bring black women in from the margins and replace them center stage. Dickerson elaborates, First, it seeks to lift the veil of silence from the lives of dry long so black women, what she considers the everyday black woman. They clean the buildings, they teach your children, they held our history. These women are so ordinary that they become invisible, disappear. Secondly, it endeavors to identify a process and an ethos of intellectual discovery that is uniquely black and feminist, end quote. Dickerson's reference to the veil invokes the works of sociologist and activist W.E.B. Du Bois and Black feminist historian Darlene Clark Hine, respectively. For Du Bois, the veil is theorized in his often cited study, The Souls of Black Folks, and symbolized the perpetuation of the color line, either through blindness or ignorance. Whereas Du Bois was concerned with racial oppression of Black folk, Hines' employment of the veil motif was her way of calling out the ways in which Black women have been oppressed twofold, for their race and their gender. And thus they have been historically ignored as subjects worthy of critical study within academia. Hines writes, quote, and that was the beginning of my commitment to telling the truth to lifting the veil, to shattering the silences about Black women in American history, end quote. Dickerson was establishing a newly emerging commitment to positioning Black women at the center of critical and creative analysis with the project for transforming through performing. It was envisioned that the panels and breakout sessions and workshops, all led by a fusion of nationally recognized scholars and artists, would contribute in accomplishing the goals of the symposium. The opening keynote performance, however, was intended to be the main event of the proposed five-day conference. The performance was being readied for the symposium 
The performance that was being ready for the symposium was Speaking in Exile, a dramatic piece conceived from interviews conducted by both Dickerson and Jacqueline Matisse with women who sought safe harbor in Tanzania after fleeing from other countries, such as Rwanda. Dickerson states, we wanted to talk to them about how they define home and how they pass on their culture to their children when they're not living at home, end quote. As the principal event of the symposium, speaking in exile would not be an ordinary dramatic performance. Like the other production envisioned for the conference, the performance was intended to culminate with an interactive dialogue with the audience, inviting them to enter the dialogue with their own thoughts on identity and transformation. What Dickerson was intending was a type of creative public scholarship that she referred to as performance scholarship. Dickerson explains that with the term performance scholarship, quote, we propose something more than a type of performance art where history and lived experiences are simply recounted. Instead, Dickerson anticipated a type of event where the prayerful performers given their bodies, give their bodies to tell the stories we tell through the enactment of the script or what she referred to as witness text. I also want to note here, I, I'm missing a note here, the prayerful performers are what she called the performers that performed um, in these projects. Whereas the witness texts are not constructed in realism, Dickerson was adamant in expressing that she did not want this work to be facile or perfunctory. Thus, the, prefer, the prayerful performers should not approach this script as if they are approaching a traditional dramatic character where they might construct a background, discover the conflict, and identify the obstacles. Dickerson explains, quote, when the body of the prayerful performer enters a dramatized historic text, or text based on real life narrative, a spiritual dimension is added by this embodying. The performer brings her own lived experiences and agrees to stand in with honor and respect for the real woman. The real woman is valorized and validated. In some cases, she can witness the act and thus seal it with her own amen." End quote. Dickerson recognized from her own experiences as both an artist and as a scholar teacher that there's often a dichotomy that exists among these two positions, especially when it comes to discourses surrounding the question of identity and the intersection of race, class, and gender, in which she argues has been a scholarly tradition. She elaborates, quote, the voice of the artist and performer, if included at all, is typically brought in as punctuation for stodgy academic proceedings. Academics read scholarly papers and then the artist performs. You do not see the artist sitting down at the table and speaking as an equal. That was one of the thoughts that I had. Something magical could happen if you included the performer, not the performing voice, but the performer's voice speaking as a scholar. Explicitly, Dickerson believed that performance could provide a new scholarly language, both practically and theoretically, to challenge the ways in which Black women and other marginalized groups were discussed within academic arenas. Additionally, the project was proposed with the idea that the audience members and artists could interact through dialogue. This dialogue was not envisioned to take place in the traditional sense, for example, through post-show discussions or talkbacks. Rather, it was envisioned that the interactive dialogue could happen during the performances. Dickerson's assessment is reminiscent of an observation that performance scholar Peggy Phelan makes about the performative writing and subsequent performances of Amanda Denise, Denise Kemp, whose work directly challenges conventional modes of knowledge production. Phelan notes, quote, much academic writing stops short of a chronicle of effect. It tends not to post the information that most deeply galvanizes the investments we make in performing and reciting. Believing in the transformative power of performance, Dickerson was moving towards a creative scholarship pedagogy that intervened in traditional modalities of teaching and learning. Kitchen Prayers, a dramatic dialogue, for example, used performance as a method in which to make traditional academic research concerning the history and lived experiences of Black women accessible to everyday audiences. As such, Dickerson termed the scripts recipes for free women. Dickerson shares how this is done practically. We shift scholarly attention to the experiences, music, literature, 
public and private conversations and everyday behaviors of ordinary, easily forgotten Black women. These become the key sources, the witness texts, for exploring Black female spirituality, as well as the meanings that women assign to mundane as well as extraordinary events in their lives. Finally, we place scholarly commentary next to the narratives of women, of women and the narratives of our audience. We use these narratives to challenge and support each other. The term kitchen is a complex and controversial term. Typically, the kitchen, through the lens of patriarchy and misogyny, is one of the spaces and homes where women were relegated to as a means to assign their domestic positioning. Dickerson, however, like many others, recognizes the kitchen as a space of possibilities. Inspired by Black feminist scholar and activist Angela Davis's theorization of the kitchen, particularly for enslaved women as a locus of resistance and agency, as she expressed in the DVD, What's Cooking in the Kitchen, Dickerson uses the term kitchen because it is a place of power. Dickerson's use of the term of the kitchen as a transformative space, especially from white male domination, is an idea taken up by several scholars engaged in feminist studies. For instance, in writing about food, culture, and race during the 19th century, Mary Titus notes, quote, the kitchen became a place where Black authority could be established and could threaten the white household at its very core. Likewise, Ogre Idris Davis maintains, quote, the kitchen became a space in which Black women could realize the inventional qualities and claim self-definition. More to the point, the kitchen offered a space in which they could begin the struggle to transform oppression into resistance and to challenge the conditions of Black women's subjugation. For the sake of Dickerson's project, the white household could be synonymous with academia and scholarly spaces that have historically marginalized Black women's creative and scholarly works. Dickerson encapsulates the above statements and expresses how they are animated within her work with the following statement, quote, by using the kitchen as the central metaphor for this work, we recreate a space in which Black women are made central. As such, the performers, whom Dickinson referred to as the prayerful performers, sit around a figurative kitchen and talk out their lives, while they simultaneously talk out the lives of the women whose stories we have agreed to embody with honor and respect. Although Dickerson concedes to being influenced by Angela Y. Davis's early work on enslaved Black women and how they have maintained a sense of agency and autonomy through domestic work, namely the kitchen, it could be suggested that Dickerson's Kitchen Prayers Project was further galvanized by Older Davis's work. I say this because in her essay, In the Kitchen, Transforming the Academy Through Safe Spaces of Resistance, published in 1999, Davis explicitly calls for Black women scholars to assume the kitchen legacy as a metaphor for elucidating the role of Black women scholars within a historically male-dominated arena. The relationship between the kitchen and the academy, according to Davis, informs African-American women experiences and historically interconnects their struggles for identity. The academy and the kitchen are part of a continuum of Black women's struggle to achieve equality and inclusion. And answering the question of how African-American intellectuals employ the kitchen legacy to intervene in white dominated spaces within the academy, Davis points to the ways in which Black women scholars, quote, redefine their importance in the domain of whiteness. They transform students and faculty alike, and they define and inform experience through provocative scholarship. Like their foremothers in plantation kitchens, African-American women scholars carve out places in the academy to nurture and transform work once relegated to kitchen space and outside mainstream departments and scholarly publications for presentation and the intellectual dinner table of the big house. In their scholarship, African-American women deconstruct previously held assumptions about politics and resistance. The experience of locating self within history underscores the efficacy of the kitchen legacy. I contend it is within the academic kitchen that African-American women scholars can locate their identity struggle and persevere in their efforts to transform the academy. 
Davis's note that this is not particularly a cerebral exercise, but the revelation of an ongoing history of struggle. She further maintains that it is in that ongoing struggle where one can work to overcome the distance between white male controlled plantation houses of departments, journals, and impersonal pedagogy and the black female kitchens of ethical care through critical pedagogy, which promotes liberation, theorizes across disciplines and centers the academy as a space for community survival and human development. With kitchen prayers, Dickerson was invested in examining the position of women within various communities through their own experiences, through their own words. As such, Dickerson conjured the words of Margaret L. Wilkerson as guiding metaphor, quote, let the world see itself through the black woman's eyes. Wilkerson's words, moreover, speak to Davison's contention that the transforming power of the kitchen legacy suggests that African-American women professors transform others by their presence and by inviting them, by inviting others into their experiences and struggle within institutions of higher learning. Both Wilkerson, excuse me, both Wilkerson's and Davis's points are actuated through Dickerson's kitchen prayer performances, which first and foremost seek to tell the stories of black women. To be clear, Dickerson was not the first to concretize a performance tradition that attempted to achieve these several ends. That is, challenge traditional modalities of pedagogy, center black women as active agents of knowledge production, and the center the narratives of black women as an example of black feminist epistemology. For instance, Joni L. Jones, Omi Osun with Sister Doctor and Amanda Kemp with This Black Body in Question have each produced their own type of black feminist performance scholarship. However, both Sister Doctor and This Black Body in Question are single performances. Thus, in thinking about creative pedagogical works connected to ex extensive projects, Dickerson's venture is closely aligned with Rodessa Jones's The Medea Project, a lengthy undertaking that uses theater workshops and staged performances to transform the lives of incarcerated women and those who can come in contact with them, such as family and friends, fellow inmates, and prison guards. A primary facet of the Medea Project is the use of narratives collected from incarcerated women to form the scripts. According to Marta Effinger Critchlow, Rodessa Jones, Rodessa Jones uses theater to heal and empower women. In essence, this was a similar strategy enacted by Dickerson for the project of transforming through performing. The tragedy of September 11, 2001 intervened, however, and rerouted Dickerson's objectives. Let me just get a quick sip of water. Okay. Just a little bit more, y'all, and then we'll, you know, we, we, I want to uh, sort of close and then we can open up for a little discussion. On September 11, 2001, Glenda was at her home in, Yip in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Upon learning of the series of coordinated terrorist attacks, specifically the planes flying into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, Dickerson states that she, quote, raced from the telephone to telephone in my house frantically trying to reach my daughter who lives in New York. Although Dickerson was relieved to learn that her daughter was safe from the catastrophe, she was still in a state of unrest. Dickerson was struck by the notion that people around the world experience these catastrophes daily. She states, it made me wonder what it must be like for women who live with this kind of terror every day. Dickerson shared that these thoughts with a Dickerson shared these thoughts with a colleague who suggested that she mull over the idea of relating the story of being unable to locate her daughter to women around the world who experience loss daily. This idea intrigued me, states Dickerson, so much so that the tragedy of 9-11 would serve as the dramatic material for the work that subsequently came to be known as the Kitchen Prayer series. The Kitchen Prayer series is a culmination of three performances, Kitchen Prayers, Performance Dialogue on 9-11 and Global Loss, Identities on Trial, a Kitchen Protest Prayer, 
and Sapphire's new shoe, The Kitchen Table Summit. Created as a dramatized presentation of actual words of women accumulated from contemporaneous sources, such as newspapers, magazines, broadcast media, and other sources from across the world, the trilogy presented a diverse array of women's memories, feelings, and views on the turbulent nature of violence and war. Dickerson writes, performances with dialogue tried to capture, reflect, and understand the impact of 9-11 and other acts of global terrorism, but offering a snapshot of a terrible moment in time. Dickerson was no longer concerned with just African and African-American women's narratives as she was with the Speaking in Exile project discussed earlier, but rather she broadened her purview to include women all around the world. As such, Dickerson aimed to interrogate how women from across the globe navigate a world where war and terror are quotidian experiences. Dickerson embarked on a journey asking, what is it like for women all around the world to live with war and terror daily? The project of transforming through performing, replacing black womenly images came to fruition in December, 2001 on the three month anniversary of 9-11. With the Kitchen Prayer series, Dickerson was not concerned with questioning what happened on 9-11 or pursuing the queries of who did it or how will we retaliate. She states, in Kitchen Prayers, I try not to worry myself with how many bombs did they drop? How many caves did they look in? Will they ever find Bin Laden? I wanna tell this side of the story, the side of the story that cannot be told because the woman's voice is left out. To that point, Dickerson was deeply committed in revealing how the disastrous events from the planes flying into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon to the subsequent war on terror affected women who live in communities where their voices are typically absent from discourses of politics and the war. Affirming this stance, she states, quote, when we are talking about war and retribution in this world on this planet, it is always a male dialogue. When you look at CNN, ABC, NBC, you primarily find men talking, arguing, pontificating. It is their story. In this context, the woman's voice is not deemed valuable and is not present, and therefore a large part of the story gets left untold. Dickerson's assertion is, is quite political, thus making her trilogy a precise example of political theater. Theater scholars Jean-Marie Colran and Jenny Spencer argue that one of the possibilities of political theater is its determinacy to be a cultural practice that self-consciously operates at the level of interrogation, critique, and intervention. Sharon Friedman contextualizes Colloran and Spencer's view on political theater. She notes that political theater ranges from, quote, acts of political intervention to raising awareness about the plight of a particular population and offering a specific political agenda for the conditions dramatized on stage to plays that function as civic forums, encouraging audiences to consider competing perspectives, thus provoking a critical and active response from viewers. It is within this vein that I perform my dramaturgical analysis of Glenda Dickerson's Kitchen Prayer series. Although the tragedy of 9-11 rocked the nation, several scholars have argued that 9-11 has been reframed through whiteness, for instance, Thomas Ross maintains 9-11 changed the nation and the world forever, at least in the collective imagination of white America. Although the victims of 9-11 were not all white, the essential face of the victims was white. Similarly, Paula Abu challenges the notion that 9-11 changed the world, especially when women, particularly women of color, still live under oppressive conditions. Abu writes, quote, for those whose everyday lives are defined by colonialism, racism, war, state terrorism, dispossession, displacement, and exile, the political commodification of September 11 perhaps best represents the privileging of white Western suffering over and above everyone else's political concerns. The above sentiments are important as we consider Dickerson's trilogy. For example, 
the first play within the trilogy, Performance Dialogue on 9-11 and Global Loss, focuses on Black women's experience with 9-11. To quote theater scholar Frida Scott Giles, the performance became an effort to process the disaster and a communal meditation on the meaning of a shared traumatic experience. As the play starts, each of the women, starting with Dickerson herself, share their personal narratives of where they were when the planes hit the Twin Towers. For instance, Dickerson recounts, quote, at 9, 10 in the morning, I am merely out of my mind as she frantically searches for her daughter, Anitra. Dickerson recollects, I know that at this time of the morning, my daughter is on the A train underneath the Twin Towers. I watch the second plane hit. I scream and call again. I watch the first tower fall. I wail and call again. The second tower falls. They're gone. But where is Anitra? Dickerson sets the tone for the remainder of the performer's remembrances of September 11th. Dickerson goes to each of the performers, calling their names and asking, where were you on 9-11? Each of the women finds herself in mourning as they witness the death of America's children. After the performers share their stories of that fateful day, Dickerson breaks the fourth wall as she poses the centralizing question to the audience. Do you remember where you were on 9-11? Amid the audience members sharing their stories, Dickerson leaves her seat and walks to the apron of the stage as if to make a bridge between the performers and the audience. She speaks directly to them. Does anyone else want to say where they were on 9-11? This moment is still quite important as it actuates one of, one of the goals of the project of transforming through performing, which is to place responsive narratives of the audience alongside the performance. In posing this question to the audience, Dickerson took the audience from the position of the spectator to the position of witness. In other words, the, the enthusiastic audience members are no longer simply spectators of a theatrical dramatic performance, but as witnesses of 9-11, and through the sharing of their own personal narratives, they have taken on a third role, the role of participant. Whether one considers this moment in the performance to be a communal meditation or a civic forum, it is most important to note that what emerges from this moment is the unfolding of a newly formed community, a community that crosses boundaries of race, gender, age, and other identity markers. This newly formed community of, is substantiated when Dickerson returns to her seat and proclaims, we are all at ground zero. Each of the prayerful performer repeats, we are all at ground zero. Throughout the remainder of the performance, Dickerson and the cast shed light on other Black women who either remembers 9-11, died in the Twin Towers, or protested the forthcoming War on Terror such as Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Harkening back to Ross and Abu, I maintain that Dickerson makes a Black feminist intervention into post 9-11 discourse, thus privileging an alter alternate viewpoint. As the performance comes near the end, performance dialogue sheds light on the turbulent nature, on the turbulent conditions that the women face around the world daily. Dickerson's lamentation is echoed in one of the closing scenes of the performance where the performers tell a story about a woman named Sahalia in Kabul. During the performance, Dickerson recites Sahalia's story. One Friday afternoon, 30,000 men and boys poured into a dilapidated Olympic sports stadium in Kabul, capital of Afghanistan. Hawkers peddled nuts, biscuits, and tea to the crowd. These circuses, have, these circuses have been weekly gatherings for the entertainment starved males of Kabul. The scheduled entertainment, a young woman named Sahalia was going to be flogged. Her crime, she was walking with a man who wasn't a relative. By shedding light on the oppressive conditions of women around the world initiates what I contend is a transnational feminist praxis through performance. The second play, Identities on Trial, A Kitchen Protest Prayer, 
further substantiate Dickerson's claim by centralizing the narratives of women who may be distant geographically, but are connected through similar acts of oppression. The, skips, the script, for instance, for identities on trial are fashioned from several sources that highlight and spread awareness of global issues, including testimonies given during the, the World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance held in Durban, South Africa in 2001. Personal testimonies taken from the summary of findings from the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal 2000 for the trial of Japanese military sexual slavery and from Women on War, an international anthology of writings from antiquity to the present, edited by poet, essayist, and performer Daniela Giuseppe. These writings, these writings are drawn from a diverse array of women who contested acts of war and instead call for peace. The poems, manifestos, and narratives collected in the anthology that Dickerson employs for her play offer a nice balance to the testimonies pulled from the tribunals. While the reflective writings and narratives may provide gruesome details of sexual exploitation, effects of war, and other horrid occurrences, collectively the stories exemplify how women from around the world and across time and space search for adequate methods to fight, resist, and survive. The final play in the trilogy, Sapphire's New Shoe, is framed by the following question. Are we better off now than we were on 9-11? This performance in the trilogy is the most mythic, wherein fict fiction, fact, present, and past collide. For example, the audience may witness Condoleezza Rice or Dr. Ruth Simmons, the first African-American woman to become president of an Ivy League university, that is Brown University, have a dialogue with deceased figures such as Madam C.J. Walker or Betsy Coleman, first black woman airplane pilot, or with mythic figures such as Aunt Jemima. Non-chronologically, the play presents a history of global women who have faced a form of gender depression yet found a way to resist. Preparing for a festive dinner at the fictional Mama Rice's house, the audience hears the stories of notable black women throughout history, such as Hannah Craft, a slave whose history has recovered, whose history was recovered by noted historian Henry Louis Gates. Similar to performance dialogue 9-11 and identities on trial, the women tell their stories to the audience in an effort to bring awareness to gendered acts of terror. Dickerson states of the trilogy, while we are focusing on the, these caves trying to locate bin Laden, women are being raped and killed in Rwanda, Sudan, Sierra Leone. Women are starving themselves to death in Turkey. All these stories that are happening just do not come to surface. Some have reported that in Pakistan, the rape of women has become so common that it has another, that it, that it, that it had another name. It's calling lying down, implying that you just lie down and take it. Take it. Another quotation is, quote, rape is so common, it is more common than the bite of a mosquito. Those are the stories that I have to tell no matter what. I want to tell these stories, but I want to include the voice of the women who are working and fighting against these kinds of oppression, because you never hear about them either. By shedding light on the oppressive conditions of, of women around the world, Dickerson executes what I contend is a transnational feminist praxis through performance. Accordingly, transnational feminism is an undergirding of Black feminist thought and practice, thus taking on a globally inclusive framework. Black feminist author and activist Audre Lorde is often referenced as a vital voice that called for feminist activists, regardless of gender identity, to overthrow the ideologies that have contributed to racist, classist, and sexist attitudes and practices, both in the United States and abroad. In her seminal essay, The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, Lord contends that feminist theory is not complete, quote, without examining our many differences and without a significant input from poor women, black and third world women. Lord's theoretical manifesto calls for a liberatory praxis that is unequivocally concerned 
but the absence of women on the margins from various communities, from larger feminist discourses. As such, my project maintains that Dickerson takes a global perspective with her work, particularly as she believed that oppression, especially for women, was a phenomenon experienced all around the world. This study further declares that this was a stance Dickerson maintained since her turn towards mainly women-centered works for which she writes about in her grand, groundbreaking essay, The Cult of True Womanhood. Quote, when you start reading ancient myths and womanist literature and traveling to countries where the people look like you, you gain a so-called perspective. Not only is the language of oppression the same world over, the anguish of women is echoed around the world and resonates from continent to continent. The torture of mothers who lose their daughters to rape, war, drugs, poverty. The suffering of women who are tortured and die in Latin American prisons. The untimely death of young women who are killed by drunk drivers or yuppie lovers in New York Central Park and then twice victimized by the courts and press. These women are, these women are sisters and suffering fixed on the fangs of the two-headed serpent. Their silenced voices, their still tongues are symbolized for me in the illegal banning of South Africans Nanzama Winnie Mandela, whom the people call mother of the nation. Dickerson's artistic mantra mirrors Lloyd's, man Lloyd's manifesto as she strives to create a theater that materializes what Lord calls difference among women's lived experiences. To help further elucidate transnational feminism as both a theory and a praxis, I turn to Black feminist studies pioneer, Gloria Joseph. In her essay, The Role of the Black Woman in the Black Liberation Movement and the Women's Movement onto Transnational Feminism, Joseph purports, quote, to say that feminism is transnational is not to say that feminist analysis and forms of political organizing cross borders in a trans historical or a historical way. But it is to say that there are particularities of the ways in which masculinity and femininity are understood and constructed and particularities of the ways in which sexual politics operate as a whole. In other words, Transnational feminism challenges the notion of monolithic or homogeneous feminism that encapsulates women around the world without taking into consideration historical and material, material differences. Joseph maintains that to initiate and sustain a transnational feminist praxis, one must be conscious of shifting the unit of analysis from local to regional and from national culture to relations across cultures. Similarly, post-colonial feminist scholar and activist Chandra Mahanti has probed for a feminist praxis that warrants strategic coalitions across class, race, and national boundaries. In her collection of essays, Feminism Without Borders, Decolonizing Theory Practicing Solidarity, specifically her canonical essay, Under Western Eyes, Feminist Scholarship and Colonial Discourses, Mahanti critiques Western feminist representations of third world feminist concerns, wherein the result is often a binary because the distinctions are made on the basis of the privilege of a particular group as the norm or referent. Furthermore, Mahanti challenges women as a category of analysis but it because it refers to the crucial assumptions that all women across classes and cultures are somehow socially constituted as a homogeneous group identified prior to the process of analysis. Given that, Mahanti writes that, quote, the homogeneity of women as a group is not produced not on the basis of biological essentials, but rather on the basis of secondary sociological and anthropological universals. Thus, the discursively consensual homogeneity of women as a group is mistaken for the historical specific material reality of groups of women. Clarifying her argument, Mahanti writes, what is problematic about this use of women as a group, as a stable category of analysis, is that it assumes an historical, a historical universal unity between women based on a generalized notion of their subordination. Instead of analytic, analytically demonstrating the production of women as socioeconomic political groups within particular local contexts, this analytical move 
limits the definition of the female subject to gender identity, completely bypassing social class and ethnic identities. As Mahanti would have it, shared oppression is not what connects women around the world. Instead, what binds women together is a sociological notion of the sameness of their oppression that in turn creates a transnational feminist collective. For this study, transnational feminism is defined as the advocacy of women's rights that crosses geographic borders while remaining cognizant of diverse histories and material differences regarding racial, sexual, class, and other sociocultural struggles. As such, transnational feminism provides a way of thinking about women in similar contexts across the world in different geographical spaces rather than as all women across the world. Seen in this light, I use transnational feminist theory to frame how Dickerson's work transgressed US borders, thus animating how the effects of war, gendered oppression, and other acts of terrorism against women, be they committed by foreign or domestic parties, are experienced globally. My project, I'm coming to the end, y'all, I promise. My project also ponders women's experiences without oversimplification and generalization. If, as Joseph states, there is a drastic need for an exchange of experiences, ideas, and strategies from all strata of women within each country. To these points, my study contends that Dickerson does not speak for global women by creating a fictive script. Instead, Dickerson's transnational feminist praxis is curated through the performer's embodiment of the actual words of the global women represented in the performance. Additionally, the exchange of experiences, ideas, and strategies that Joseph calls for happens when the performers, through the process and preparation and execution of the performance, are transformed into performance scholars, enabling the performance, excuse me, enabling the audience to th synthesize and theorize relationships across history, across cultures, across academic and performance disciplines. Both the performance and the audience then are connected within a performance that interrogates global subjectivities with, it, with the further goal of forming transnational solidarities. Coming to conclusion, while Dickerson may have been one of the first black women playwrights to dramatize the anxieties of 9-11 and its aftermath, in doing so, she joins a legacy of black women playwrights who have written about war since the turn of the 20th century. One of the goals of this analysis then is to place Glenda Dickerson alongside other black women playwrights that have written what is dubbed as war plays. Thus my project aims to address a dearth in dramatic criticism by expanding the relatively small body of literature that illustrates how black women playwrights have made a black feminist intervention in a mostly white and predominantly male dominated arena. As Marilyn Elkin notes, quote, African-American women have insisted in raising their voices and protest against the wars in African-American and world history and on demonstrating their ability to write about such forbidden subjects. Black women playwrights, moreover, have broadened the scope of what constitutes a war play. Many war plays by black women playwrights go beyond dramatizing action on the battleground. Some of them illustrate the impact that war has on soldiers and their families, such as the effects of, such as the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder. These works include Alice Dunbar Nelson's My Eyes Have Seen, Mary P. Burrell's Aftermath, Mae Miller's Stragglers in the Dust, Lorraine Hansberry's Drinking Gourd, Adrian Kennedy's A Rat's Mass, and Jazaki Shange's for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow was enough, and Devere Smith's piano, Lynn Nottage's Ruin, and The Odds, Janine Neighbors' Black Girl Gone, and Susan Laurie Parks' Father Come Homes from the Wars. Additionally, Black women playwrights who write about war have also expounded on what constitutes war through their works. Whereas the term war typically denotes a battle between two or more distinct territories, Black women playwrights have used the term to include and address racial terrors and racism, inner city intercultural strife, 
and warring among different ethnic groups, among other topics. As a collective, these Black women playwrights have produced vital and challenging works of theater and performance that address a wide range of pressing social and political problems for women, touching the global and the local. Moreover, they have challenged gendered terrains, particularly as they've given voice to those often silenced or ignored in official stories by politicians and the mass media. With her project, Glenda Dickerson presents a remarkable narrative in world history. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Please do clap from wherever you are. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Long, for such a wonderful, intriguing project.